Well, this week we are going to wrap up our discussion of this, uh, this series in which we've been trying to integrate our faith life with our work life. Uh, we may come back to it another time, a couple of other times this summer. I've got a couple little plans, but, um, but next week we're going to missions weekend and we'll move on and talk about something else. But uh, here's what we said for the last several weeks, that if you can successfully integrate your faith life with your work life, then you are well on your way to spiritual maturity. And you are well on your way to living your full potential in Christ. However, it's, the opposite is also true. That, that if, if your job, your career, your work life is kind of off limits to God, that that is just going to be a roadblock that you bump up a time and time and time again, and you will struggle to really live your, 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 full, uh, your full potential in Jesus Christ. And so we've said we need to talk about our work. And what we said is your work, it matters. It matters to God how you live, how you treat people. It matters how you work. And what we said was, what was the, the basis for this, the theological basis of, of God's opinion of our work, goes all the way back to the beginning of the story when God created everything. And see, see, see the temptation for us is to think that I don't like work. If you hate your job, you say, I, I, I wish I didn't have to be there. The good life is a life where we don't have to work. And so work must be bad. It's hard, it's painful, it's frustrating, it's full of stress. Work must be bad, and theologically speaking, you know, when sin entered the world, maybe that's when work came in. Surely there was no work before there was sin in the world because when we all go to heaven, when Jesus brings his kingdom, however you kind of, however you kind of describe the end, right? Surely the plan then is that we won't have to work, that we will sit in heaven in our golden cloud easy chairs and we will kick up our feet worshiping Jesus, resting with no work for all eternity. It'll be like eternal retirement, right? Praise God, that's what heaven's going to be like because surely we won't have to work because work is bad, result of the fall, sin, all of that. No. What we see in scripture is that God creates the world, everything in it. And even before he is done creating, he gives the humans a job. It's almost as if God creates the world, everything in it, and he gets it wonderful and perfect. And then he says, now I'm handing the baton to you. I've created this beautiful place. And in the story, it's a beautiful garden with everything they could ever need. And he says, now you take the garden and you tend it, work it, take care of it. Nurture the plants and the animals. It'll continue to grow and you'll enjoy the fruits of your labor. You're going to work it. Work is good. And if that is true, and we believe it's true because the Bible says it's true, then we need to value hard work. We do value hard work. We value when somebody works really hard and they do their best and there's a nice finished product. You, you, that's why the, at the end of the day, when you're tired and you're physically tired, but you have worked hard to produce something that you feel good about it because the, the fruit of your labor is, is the result of it. And even though you're tired, you feel good about it because of the value of hard work. Several years ago, when we were living in the Kansas City area, Erica and I were headed down to southern Missouri, and um, it's the, the part of southern Missouri is really green, lots of trees. They would say mountains, but they've never been out here, so, you know, just, it's all right. They just keep thinking they're mountains, whatever. Anyways, it's, it's the Ozarks, right? The beautiful tree-covered hills of the Ozarks in southern Missouri, and um, there's a small Christian college um, that is named the College of the Ozarks, and we had several friends say, you know what, on your way down, you should time it just right, and you stop and at the College of the Ozarks, right on the edge of the campus, is this huge lodge that they've built, and inside is the dining room restaurant, and it is wonderful. You've got to experience it. Stop there. So we're like, oh, okay. Stop in. <laughs> Great food. It's staffed entirely by students of the college. And so they just tell you that, you know, your, your waiter or waitress is going to be one of the students of the college. Ask them what their career plans are. Ask them about their major. Ask them where they're from. And so it was this great experience. I mean, the food tasted good. It was reasonably priced. The atmosphere was great. It was all kind of handmade furniture. But, but every one of the students who worked there, they were, they were smart, they were articulate, they were kind and respectful. You know, if, if you have ever thought like, oh man, the future is just terrible when I look at students around me. No, you just go there and you're like, no, the future is in good hands if it's like these kids are going to be the leaders. One of the things that makes College of the Ozarks unique and highly attractive is that students, every student graduates with their bachelor's degree, and they all graduate completely debt-free from a private Christian college. 
That's why they have an acceptance rate of about 14%, because they get thousands of applicants for not very many positions, because you get to graduate debt free. How do they do that? They say, if you're going to be a student at our college, we expect that we are, well, we're going to give you a job, and we expect that you will work 15 hours a week every week, and then two weeks out of the year, you're going to give a full 40 hours a week, because everybody works. And you might get a job there in the campus restaurant. You might get a job working the grounds. You might get a job on the farm that produces some of the food in the restaurant and the dining halls. You might get a job in the jelly factory where they make and sell jelly. You might get a job in my favorite, the fruitcake factory where they make and sell fruitcakes for incredibly high prices that helps fund the whole operation. Several years ago, the Wall Street Journal did a, did a, did a highlight of the college in a news article, and they nicknamed College of the Ozarks, Hard Work You. And the college liked it so much they adopted it as their official nickname. And they got t-shirts, Hard Work You. Now, think about this. If students work 15 hours a week on a campus job, campus, work on a job on campus, is that really going to pay for the entire cost of their education? <coughs> no, not really. It happens because folks of considerable means who also value hard work say, you know what, if you're going to teach our future leaders the value of hard work, and if you're going to make them work for their education, I am going to invest in that. And people give millions of dollars to support this value of hard work. Because work is good. And learning the work ethic and to have and to go into adulthood with a strong, hard work ethic is good. It sets you up for success. We know that. Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. Here's what he said. Genius, genius is 1% inspiration, brains, smarts. 99% perspiration. Hard work is good. You and I, especially as followers of Jesus, we ought to be known as the hardest working folks around. It's part of our witness. It's part of having high attractive moral values that give good witness to Jesus. But, just like too much of a good thing can become a bad thing, too much work can be a bad thing. Just like too much of a good thing that becomes the only thing becomes a really bad thing, too much hard work when it becomes the only thing in your life, it becomes a bad thing. We need to talk about that today. See, we know that hard work is rewarding and fulfilling. And so some of us enjoy the fruits of our labor and hard work, and we work too much to where it becomes not good for us. And eventually, the best thing you can do for yourself is to quit working. Eventually, the best thing you can do for your family that you are working hard to support is to quit working. Even if you own your own business and it's all based on you and it's a one-employee business and that's you and you've never heard of this thing called paid time off, all you've got is unpaid time off, which is time that you're not working, you're not making any money, and all the income depends on you. One of the best things you can do for the success of your business is to quit working. If you hate your job, Maybe the reason you hate your job is not because you hate what you do, but you hate the fact that you are allowing your job to consume your life. Today we're going to talk about how to keep your job from overtaking your life. Today we're going to talk about the importance of quit time. To do that, we're going to go back to the story, this origin story, and we find out what happens at the end of creation. So the story is told that God creates the world in order, and it's, and it's this orderly process of God who creates the world, the universe, everything in it, and, 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 it's, a, and it's told like a series of days, and the first day God does this, the next day God does the next part of creation, the next day God does the next part of creation. By day six, he creates the animals in the morning, in the afternoon he creates the humans, and, and, and what happens is, as he goes along, the later part of the week, he looks at what he's created, and it says, the story says, God saw all that he created, and he saw that it was good. God smiles at what he created. The next day he does the next part of the creation and he says that God saw all that he created and it was good. Now look at the end of the story. He's created the humans. He's created everything. Look at it says. Genesis chapter 1 verse 31. 
God saw all that he had made. And it was not just good. It was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. So God steps back. He's created everything. All the work of creation is finished. And he looks back and he's like, man, I'm kind of proud of myself. I did a good job with all this. I even created those humans. I gave them a job to do and they didn't say no and talk back. And they're down there doing it, taking care of the earth. Man, it's been a long week, though. I've worked really hard. So on day 7, verse 2 of chapter 2 here, by the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. He did have a part, a part that he was going to do. He handed the baton off to the humans and said, now nurture, take care of, continue to grow the earth that I've given you. And so on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. Then God blessed the seventh day. And he made it holy. Because on it, he rested from all of the work of creating that he had done. Which raises an interesting question. Why would God need to rest? He's God, after all. Almighty, all-powerful, has all the resources to do everything he wants to do. I mean, I know, like, six days of creating the earth, the world, the universe, the galaxies, everything in it. I mean, that would wear me out, but I mean, he's infinite God. Surely he wasn't worn out, was he? He was tired and needed a break, needed to rest. We would, but we're not God. Why would God need to rest? Maybe he didn't need to rest, but just chose to because maybe he wanted to model for us the importance of the value of hard work and the value and importance of at the end of the week, it's time to quit and rest and enjoy the results of all the work. See, as the story goes on later, generations later, we read through the story of Genesis, which is a pretty crazy story, and uh, some crazy things happen. If you've never read it, you should read it. It's super fascinating, okay? And then in the book of Exodus is the next kind of book, and in that book, we find that God's people, God's specially chosen people, they are slaves in Egypt. Slaves of Egypt, the most powerful empire of the time, and God looks down on them, and he hears their cries, and it breaks his heart. He says, this isn't good. I don't want my specially chosen people to be in slavery. So he raises up a guy named Moses. He says, Moses, you're going to be the mouthpiece, but I'm going to be the power, and we're going to lead our people out of Egypt. It's a crazy story. It's a miraculous story of God works and moves. If you haven't read it, you should read it. It's fascinating. God's awesome. He brings them out, and now once they are safe from the Egyptians, he says, all right, I'm going to bring you into the land, and I'm going to give you land, and you're going to settle down. You're going to be my people. You're going to be an experimental kind of nation that has never existed before, because you're not going to have a king, because I, God, am going to be your king. And you're going to live my way. You're, you're not going to worship lots of gods that you've made up and invented to trust in. No little idols, no carving statues that you're going to bow down to. You're going to worship me, the one and only God, in one place that I will designate. And you're going to treat each other differently. You're going to live by my values and my standards. So God gives them a series of laws for how to worship him, how to treat each other, how to treat their families and their spouses and their kids, and how to live as a society. And he gives them civil laws, religious laws, personal laws, all that type. In those laws is where we find the Ten Commandments. As this kind of a sample summary of how he wants them to live. Genesis, I mean Exodus Chapter 20, we find the Ten Commandments. Guess what he says in one of those commandments? Now, now you, you've probably heard of the Ten Commandments before. Do not murder, do not steal, don't commit adultery, uh, don't lie. Basic laws for how we should treat each other, treat God. Look at what he says in commandment number four. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day. By the word, by the way, Sabbath just simply means seventh. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it Holy. Now, if you read some of this before, you kind of know where he's going. But before you go there, we need to stop and look at the first thing God says about this day, the Sabbath. It is holy. What does it mean for something to be holy? It means that it belongs to God. And if you take something that is holy and belongs to God and you mess with it, you desecrate it, you dishonor it. Okay, it'd be like this, okay? Imagine that you are such a great person. 
that on your spouse's birthday, you go to him or her and you say, honey, I love you so much and this is your day. So I'll tell you what, today is going to be all about you. This is your day completely. Whatever you want to do, you get to do. Whatever you want us to do, we are going to do because this is your day. <laughs> And around my house, that may go something like this. Great. I'd love it if we could get the lawn mowed today, which means if you would mow the lawn, honey. And if we could fix that leaky faucet that I've been asking that we could get fixed for about four months now. And then if we could just kind of maybe have a nice afternoon and then go out for dinner and a date tonight. And if you say, if you meant it when you said that this is going to be a day that's all for them, all about them, you go put your white A6 lawn mowing shoes on and get out there and start mowing the lawn, and then you would, uh, and then you'd go fix that leaky faucet that she's been asking you to fix for months and months, and then you'd take her out to dinner that night. Why? Because it is her day, his day, you gave it to them. They get to call the shots for what happens that day. And so, Sabbath day. The Lord's day, it's holy unto him. What does God want us to do on his day? <coughs> Go to church? Serve others? Well, yeah, but, but look what he says. Look what he says right after that. Here's what I want you to do on my day. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work. But the seventh day, it's a Sabbath to the Lord your God. It's holy, it's my day. And so on it, you shall not do any work. Neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant. Like, you can't work, you can't make anybody else work. Nor your animals, not even the foreigner residing in your towns. Look at the reason here. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, all that's in them. But even he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he made it holy. How does God want you to honor him on his day? The first thing he wants you to do is rest. Stop working. Like I said, one of the Ten Commandments. It's really interesting when we have conversations about the Ten Commandments. Folks would say, yeah, the Ten Commandments, basic rules for how we should live life, treat each other, worship God. And we don't have a problem with any of the Ten Commandments. They're just so basic and so obvious. Like, don't kill people, don't steal, don't, you know, worship one God, don't make any idols of other gods and worship them. It's pretty basic. <clears throat> Until we get to commandment number four, this one, we're like, yeah, I don't know about that. That doesn't seem very reasonable or very possible. Don't murder people, don't steal from them. Entirely, totally reasonable. I can do that, everybody should do that. One day that belongs to God, no work, and we can't. I live by the Nine Commandments. <laughs> you might actually be living by the Nine Commandments if I looked at your schedule. Let me give you a real life example. I don't know if this guy's a Christian follower of Jesus or not, but um, you know, folks are discovering that, believe it or not, God knew what he was up to and the need and the importance of rest. Spanish chef Andoni Luis Aduriz is considered one of Spain's most influential and creative chefs. His restaurant has been ranked by Restaurant.com as the fourth best restaurant in the world. His kitchen is credited with some of the most revolutionary advances in the culinary world. Recently, he was featured as a judge. Episode 2 of Netflix is the final table. This guy works hard. You don't become the number four restaurant in the world without hard, hard work. What's his secret? He was asked recently about innovation and how he remains so innovative and so creative. And here's what he said. Here's how he does it. He closes his restaurant for four months every year. You know, I remember one time realizing how difficult it would be to be in the restaurant business. They're open every day of the week. They open early for the breakfast crowd, stay open for the lunch crowd, and stay open for the dinner crowd seven days a week. Can you imagine how, how it would be, how grueling it would be? You would have to love what you do to just survive the grueling schedule of owning a restaurant. And knowing this, he shuts down four months of the year. Here's what he said. We closed the restaurant for four months a year. We realized that if we wanted to, to we realized that if we wanted to do something truly important, we would have to stop, reflect, and discover new ideas. 
You don't do that unless you have planned opportunities to rest. Stop working. Rest and create innovation. The story keeps on going. And this is the part where the Bible gets difficult to read. The last half of Exodus is like law after law after law and sacrifice. Uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's really, really hard to read. But, but uh, there's a point to all of it. You really should read all of it. In the book of Deuteronomy, we find that Moses, Moses the leader, he's now an old man. And, and God has hindered the people from going into the land he gave them because they disobeyed. But now the next generation is ready. And Moses gathers up all the people and he says, I'm going to pass away. As soon as I do, Joshua's going to be the next leader. And I'm the last of my generation. And when I'm gone, Joshua's going to lead you into the land God has given you. But he says, don't forget God. God made this all possible. He looks at the next generation. He says, remember when you were kids and you were slaves in Egypt. And now you are free. Now you're going to go into this land that God has given you. You're going to build houses. You're going to settle down. You're going to plant your fields. You're going to work really, really, really hard. Don't forget what God has told you. Don't forget that you are to live for God with all of your life. He kind of recaps and summarizes the law that God has given him. So as a part of that, he gives them the Ten Commandments again. And he doesn't change them because they haven't changed. God, God doesn't change the rules. But as he describes this commandment, number four, he adds another reason for it. Remember the first time God gave it, he said, because I created the world in six days, and on the seventh day I rested. Now he gives an additional reason for why they should rest based on what they have just experienced. So Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15 is where he describes it here. He says, remember, you were slaves in Egypt. Remember the Lord your God. He brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. See, slavery is the ultimate perversion of the goodness of work. Where somebody else forces you to do their work while they sit back, and they don't even pay you anything unless they don't, unless they feel like it. They give you some food so that you can work some more, but as soon as you're no longer beneficial to them, they just cast you aside. And God says, I hate slavery. God says, I don't want you to be a slave work. God knows our excuses. He knows the little voices that run through our heads. I don't have enough time to get it all done. I have so much to do in so little time. I have more things on my to-do list than I can ever get done and I don't have enough time. I don't have the time to take one day to just do nothing because the list will get longer. God says, then you have become a slave to your work. I don't want you to live in slavery. And so, so as not to become a slave, God says, I want you to put habits in place so that you get regular rest and resist the urge to give yourself to a life of slavery. Here's someone else who's discovered the power of rest. <coughs> World-class long-distance runner Bernard Legon. Born in Kenya, he's a citizen of the United States, and he's a four-time Olympian. He has seven American records, ranging from the 1,500 to the 5,000 meters races. In the 2012 London Olympics, he finished fourth in the 5,000. It's hard on his muscles and joints, but he's by now probably 40 years old and shows no signs of slowing down. But Bernard has something unique about his own training schedule. Every fall, he does something that is completely foreign to most foreign runners. He takes a five-week break, just like he's done every year since 1999. According to an article in the New York Times, he will toss his sneakers into the closet and pig out for five weeks. <laughs> no running, no sit-ups, no heavy lifting except for a fork. <laughs> oh, and by the way, he also coaches his son's soccer team during those weeks. Another longtime running coach, track and field official, claims that Lagat's approach is unique. He says, in the United States, runners are obsessive about not letting go of their training. But he stands by his need for sustained rest. He said, you know, I know every athlete is different. But he says this, my runs are very hard. Everything I do is hard. 
The body is tired. You're not a machine. Rest is a good thing. What would it look like for you to plan for one day of rest every week? You say, Jason, all that is all the Old Testament. And that was like law, now we're living under grace. You know what, if you're living under grace, it ought to be all that much easier to enjoy the grace of God's rest. One of the ways of interpreting that is if we are living under grace, then it doesn't have to be a particular day of the week. <laughs> Someone would ask me today, he said, I've got hay that is down and the rain is coming on Tuesday. Does that mean I can't? Go out and hay today. I said, well, if we go hay, cut it tomorrow, cut it today, bale it tomorrow, whatever it is, come Tuesday when it's raining. In the grace of the Lord Jesus, you take Tuesday while the rain is falling, you rest. You see, there's a bigger issue at work here. It's more than just a rule or a command from God. As we have said before here, God always wants to get to the heart of the issue. And here's the heart of the issue. After giving them, reminding them of the Ten Commandments, Moses says, Look, you're going to go into this land that God is giving you. You're going to work hard because we value hard work. And you're going to build your houses. You're going to build your farms. You're going to plant your fields. And by the sweat of your brow, you will work hard and you will, you will harvest your crops. And you'll store some of it for next year. You'll enjoy it. You'll feast with your family. You'll raise your family. You'll have children. Eventually, you'll have grandchildren. Life will be good. You will reap the benefits of your hard work. And Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 10. When you have eaten and you are satisfied, Make sure that you praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you don't forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Why? Because the only reason you have what you have is because God has given it to you. And yes, you've done a good job being responsible and working really hard, and you're going to receive and, and, and enjoy the rewards of your hard work, but don't you forget where it came from. I remember I was working with a young guy, and I loved his honesty. He said, you know, I really struggle with my faith because I go to work every day, and I work hard. And I give it everything I've got, and I feed my family, support my family. And I feel like I'm the one doing all this. Why should I give God the credit for it? And I thought, man, there is someone who is saying, honestly, most of us are living. Maybe you've thought before, we just didn't have the guts to say it out loud. And after that discussion, praying and not knowing exactly how to respond to him, God showed me this, these couple of verses right here that I think are so powerful. You need to underline them, highlight them, dog you the pages. Listen to what he says here that we, we hard workers would be wise to remember. Verse 17, you may say to yourself, my power, the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But... Remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so He confirms His covenant, which He swore to your ancestors, as it is today. The only reason you have what you have, the only reason you are able to work hard, is because God has given you the ability to work hard. Don't forget that. The only reason that you have crops in your field is because God has given you sun and rain and soil to make it all grow. And yeah, you work hard, but you got to remember where it all came from. As soon as you forget, you are in trouble. Don't forget where it all came from. So why should you worship? <coughs> because when the times get tough, the rain doesn't come. There's too much sun. You're either going to depend on yourself or on God. The real issue is too much of a good thing when it becomes the only thing. It becomes your idol. And when work, well, it's really easy for us to allow work to become our idol. 
Well, when those thoughts run through our minds like, if I don't work, I won't have a house, I won't have a savings, I won't have retirement, I won't have food to feed my family. You know what? You need to be responsible. But taken too far, you begin to depend on yourself. When you say things like, I can't take a day of rest. There's too much work that has to be done. I can't give a day to God. I have too much of, of my work that needs to be done. What you're essentially saying is, I can't take, I can't trust God to take care of me because I have to take care of me. And when you're fully depending on yourself and your hard work, you have become your own false God. You're in trouble. And that is a dead end road every time. But when you choose to rest, you are making a bold, faith-filled statement. I trust in Jesus, not myself. When you choose once per week to take a day that begins in rest, when you choose to gather for worship and together we say, God, it's not about me. It's all about you. And everything that we have is from you. It's all for you. And we're going to use it for you. And our whole lives is, are for you, God. We are reminded. And we remind each other and we encourage each other that work is good, but only in an appropriate amount. At the end of every day, at quick time, we put down our tools, we close the laptop, and we go home. Enjoy the fruits of our labor, the people that God has blessed us with. Then at the end of the week, at quitting time, we lock up the office, we park the truck for a couple of days, we go home, and enjoy the fruits of our labor, and rest, and remember where it all came from. Because someday, you will clock out for the last time. And I, Jesus, and your friends and your family, when you do, we want you to have something to go home to. We want you to have someone to go home to. And all of that will happen after quitting time. If you choose to quit. What would it look like for you? Just imagine Go home at the end of the day. Turn the cell phone upside down, put it on the kitchen counter. Enjoy your family. Attend your small group. Engage in relationships. Go home at the end of the week. Spend time with family and friends. Enjoy the beautiful creation that God has given us. And take a deep breath and breathe it all in. Come to worship with your church friends and be reminded of what this is all about. And be reminded that your work is funding your life, not the other way around. So here's what I ask you to do this week. Here's the resolution this week. This week, I will work hard, and then I'll rest. Try it. And then try it next week. And then try it next week. And then try it the week after that. And you will find this is the best way to live. God knew what he was talking about all along. Pray with me. God, thank you for the gift of rest. I pray that we would really take you on. God, teach us hard workers how to rest well and trust you with our lives. Lord, I pray that as we are resting, that the constant barrage of thoughts, things that aren't getting done, oh God, would you just, Lord, would you overwhelm those with your voice of truth and assurance. It's going to be okay. You're going to take care of us. Teach us to trust in you. Teach us to rest in you, Lord Jesus. We'll follow you this week. We'll trust you this week.